Okay, hello everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. This should be fun. I'm really looking forward to my first beer, by the way. After the show, I, was, I was watching enviously as lots of people drinking beer. I've been good and not had a beer yet. Before I start, I have three questions to ask the room. Firstly, are you ready? Are you going to take a picture? <laughs> so the first question is, how many people use Jenkins right now? How many people use Jenkins? Oh, look at all the sound boxes. Okay, that's good. Well played. Thank you very much. How many people use Jenkins X right now? Yay! Awesome! Okay, that's more. That's perfect. Thank you very much. And how many people are vaguely aware of who Cloud V is and what we do? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Okay, that's good. That's good. We'll test it. Okay, now, now for the real stuff. Okay, let me talk about Jenkins X. But first, I want to talk about the Accelerate book. How many people have read the Accelerate book or bought the Accelerate book and meant to read it? Okay, a couple of people. So, uh, I can't uh, recommend this book high enough. For me, this is the best tech book. If you buy one book this decade, it should be the Accelerate book, right? It's hugely, hugely important. It's the best book in years and years and years. And it's good on so many levels, and I could probably talk with the beverage after this talk uh, at length about how awesome this book is, because it's awesome on so many levels. But for me, what's awesome, so basically, this is the book that Nicole and Jen and Jean did that's based on the State of DevOps Report survey. So every year, they've been doing this State of DevOps Report, trying to find out what is it that high-performing teams do that's better than low-performing teams, and to compare high, medium, low-performing teams in what their practices are, how they do things, because building software is really complicated, right? We're trying to make software that helps users. We're trying to guess what those features are, that if we add them into some software, we're gonna make some money. And nobody really knows what we're doing. We're all kind of winging it. We're all experimenting and trying things out. And it, we're all kind of guessing. And it's really easy to make the wrong thing and to waste a year or two years building the thing that no customer even wants, right? So it's really, really hard, right? Building software is really hard. What this book goes into is what are the practices that you should do to become good at it, right? And there's lots of amazing things in the book. I, I could go on at length about the amazing things, but the really heartwarming thing in the book is any team can become high performing, right? It doesn't mean you need a Seattle office and only hire ex Amazon and Netflix employees. Yes, good people always helps, but any team can become high performing, right? You don't have to just hire ninja rock stars who've written a programming language or something. <laughs> uh, like, literally, any team is good. Uh, to just point, like, diverse teams are good. Having some experienced people, some newbies, uh, having some people who focus on UX, some people who like back end systems, some kind of really anal people who don't like things broken. Like, have a mixture of teams. But what's amazing in the book is it basically tells you how to become high performing. Right? It's basically about what you do and how you do it. It's not quite such a big deal about the technology you're using and the languages and the framework. It's about how you do it. And so there's, the book goes into all of these different things that you should do to become high performing. But the thing that I think sh still shocks me when I, I think of saying this out loud, they found that high performing teams are up to 2,600 times faster than low performing teams. Right? I remember a year or so uh, on Twitter people were saying, there's no such thing as a 10x developer, someone who's 10 times faster, that doesn't really exist. I've worked with some very ineffective developers in my time who, who generally produce very little of value, and I've worked with some amazing developers who produce a So I think that's bullshit, but anyway, whatever. But the book has proven some teams at the team level, because it's really about teams, not individuals. Teams can be 2,600 times faster. And this is not just some teams chuck stuff over the wall and it's all terrible code and it's all crappy, but they just release very frequently. The high performing teams deliver higher value, higher quality code that has less bugs in it. And if ever they find a bug, they fix the bugs quicker. So it's not this kind of let's all just chuck code over the wall and hey, we're high performing. It's let's all get in the habit of delivering business value to our customers quickly that's high value, it's got low bug count, and we end up with happier customers. The aim that we're all kind of doing, we're basically all software companies now. We're all working for software companies pretty much. The world is full of software companies. Our aim is to deliver critical business value to our customers quickly. But the way to do that, because most things we do is wrong and doesn't seem to work or doesn't really resonate with users, the only real way of doing this is doing it in small increments, getting those small increments in front of users and getting feedback and getting that iterative feedback and continuously delivering lots of little bits of value to customers and getting that vital feedback. The worst thing you can do, and I've seen this on lots of projects in my time, the worst thing you can do is sit in your ivory tower for two years thinking you've totally cracked it and you know exactly the software to do. And then two years later, you show it to a user and they go, I 
I didn't want that. I want this. Right? So the only real way of delivering business value is by incrementally delivering value quickly. So it's about speed. It's not about speed and just chucking random code over the wall and hoping it works. We have to make code that works and is easy to operate and easy to manage. We need to do lots of things like use the cloud well, do continuous delivery, continuous integration, trunk-based development. There's lots of details, but the basic idea is work in very small batches and get those batches in front of customers as quick as you possibly can. The quicker you can get it in front of a customer, the more iterations you can get. So for a fixed amount of time, you've had more feedback from users. So you get ever closer to where you're going to go. It's kind of we're all heading in a direction, and we course correct with feedback from actual users, right? And that feedback could be operational feedback, like your stuff crashes all the time now since you did that last change, or it could be users aren't clicking on the buy button anymore, and you're trying to make money here, so they should maybe click the buy button. So maybe you need to change it to make them click buy. So it's it's operational feedback, it's user feedback, it's UX feedback, it's operational feedback. But without feedback, we're just goofing, hacking code, which is it's fun, but it doesn't really help the bottom line of the business, right? So as software people, we all need to get good at delivering business value. And this book basically tells you how to do it. It's amazing. And there's loads and loads of stats in here that I could rattle off lots of them. But one of my other favorite ones that the, this year they asked for the first time ever, um, they found that teams that use the cloud well are on, on average seven times faster than all other teams. And what, so what do they mean by use the cloud well? If you need to raise a service now ticket to be allowed to create a VM, that's not using the cloud well. Like using the cloud well is not saying, I used to have two VMs under my desk, and I now have two VMs on EC2. That's not using the cloud well, right? Using the cloud well is having self-service um, infrastructure, hardware, CPU, network, storage, and letting developers just create stuff they need to deliver the business value, right? You don't want one person saying, if you want a database, you have to come to me. And I say yes or no. Like the aim of using the cloud well is to empower developers to go out and build stuff and experiment and solve the business problems that they're empowered to solve, right? Which is quite a big change, right? I know lots of us have worked in organizations where there's a central team and say, we decide what runs on what hardware. And you have to have all these meetings and debates of like, please, can I just have another VM? And can you? And then that takes six months. And then you say, well, can I open a port so I can get into it now? And it just becomes this horrendous thing. Using the cloud well means you can go click, click. You now have something live on Amazon or, or Google or whatever. It could be on-premise. It could be on a private cloud. It could be public cloud. It could be hybrid. But using the cloud well is all about empowering developers to go fast and deliver value, right? This is the point. This is what we should all be thinking about and focusing on, right? The world has become very competitive. Now, I'm not trying to scare you or anything like that. What I'm trying to say is there's an amazing opportunity for all of us. If we all become high-performing teams, we will end up in successful businesses. If we don't become those high-performing teams, and we're the 2,600 times slower team, just think of how quick a competitor is going to sail by, by you in like one year. Like you could do one day's work and you're three years ahead of another team. I mean, you could do two days a week and just put another team out of business. Like we, we should maybe not do that, but you know. So we should all become high performing teams. But the great thing is, don't be scared. It's just buy the book, just go through the book and just do what it says, right? It's fairly simple stuff. Now, some of these you've probably all heard of before. A lot of this is not, you know, rocket science or anything kind of crazy. So uh, firstly, you. We all use version control, right, for our source code. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that's true, right? Does anybody not use version control for their source? Thank God. OK, that's good. But we need to do other things, like let's version all of our artifacts, right? Who, who uses snapshots for all their stuff? OK. Please don't anymore, OK? Just, just generate a version number, right? So the problem with snapshots is nobody knows when that snapshot changes ever. Right. As soon as you start using snapshots everywhere, everyone's using snapshots and it's like, everything's working, everything's working, everything's broken, everything's broken. Why did it break? I don't know. Some, some random snapshot. Somebody must have built something. <laughs> right. What? How do I know? Just use a version number. Then you know it's working on one, it's working on two, it's working on three, it doesn't work on four. It doesn't work on four. I know the answer. It doesn't work on four. Don't use four. Use three. Go back to three. Like If you use a version number, you know what's going on. You understand what's happening. Never use snap. Please try not to use snapshots. Right? It's not a high performance team. Version artifact because it makes it easier to go fast because everything's more repeatable. Um, automate your deployment process. Now, one of the things that's amazing about software right now, this is the best time there's ever been to work in software. It's a truly amazing. It's slightly scary because a lot of things are happening in a very quick pace. Five years ago, there was no Docker. 
but sadly over five years, let's call it five. Five years ago, there was no doctor, nobody really, apart from kind of very uh, strange Solaris people in the bar at night, nobody really talked about containers. Um, no one, Kubernetes wasn't even a thing. The public cloud people said, yeah, that'll never really work. VMs are where it's at. Like, just look at now, right? Every public cloud and every cloud provider of every kind has a managed Kubernetes offering. There is now a canonical standard way of deploying containers at scale on any infrastructure anywhere, right? On-premise, uh, air gaps, behind the firewall, private cloud, public cloud, even Amazon supports uh, Kubernetes. Maybe not as well as Google and Amazon uh, uh, and Azure, but it supports it pretty well, right? ETS is, is pretty reasonable. So a lot has changed in the last few years, a lot has changed. How we package and deploy software has completely changed. So let's automate that stuff. Another thing that's happened in the last kind of four or five years is a lot of us have gone crazy on the microservices thing. Now some people say, oh, microservices, it's just a trend. The whole point of microservices is it's a trick to go faster. Do you remember the mythical man month book that said you have a massive team and it's going too slow, so you try and, how do we make a big team go faster? We add more people and it goes slower. If you add more people to a team, it goes slower. Adding people to a team slows the team down. The hack to go faster is have more teams. Well, it's not just that. Have more teams that work independently. That This is the trick. If you add more and more teams and make them all work together to get a release out, everything slows down. You go slower and slower. And the more people you add and the bigger the scale of the monolith, the slower everything becomes and the more risk and the more testing you have to do to release anything. And everything just gradually goes slower and slower and slower. Before you know it, some, some other company has streamed past you. Some Netflixy, Amazon style, Uber, Airbnb company has steamed past you and you're out of business, right? So the microservice thing is not just a buzzword. I know with IT we get these trends and we all think, oh, it's another buzzword. Oh, we still working. Uh, microservice is kind of a buzzword, but really it's about having lots of teams, split them up into independent teams. Each team owns a bunch of code. That team then releases that code whenever they want, whenever they think that code's ready. And then that team should run that code. So that team can then iterate quickly, and that team runs the code. It doesn't chuck it over a wall to some poor ops team and goes, that's your problem now, <laughs> right? You run the code yourself, because as soon as you run the code yourself, you then get into the habit of going, oh, that code failed yesterday, didn't it? Why, why didn't I put some logging in? So then when it fails, we know why it logged. And then we can find find out why it logged, and let's stop it doing that thing it just did. And over time, you start becoming a bit more SRE-like, where you make software that's designed to run well in production, and you less focus on code that's got an interesting code layout or something. You focus on the most important thing. Code should work well in production and be easy to manage. That's the most important thing to focus on. So the whole microservice thing, as soon as you go microservices, a lot of interesting things happen. If you're, if you're working on a monolith that releases <coughs> twice a year, it literally doesn't matter what your release pipeline is. It could literally be typing commands in SSH on a couple of VMs, right? It really doesn't matter. You do it twice a year, who cares? If you've got a thousand microservices in your organization that are releasing 10 times a day, I hope you're not manually writing a pipeline for each one of those thousand microservices. And then worse, managing those thousand pipelines. You want to automate all that stuff, right? So as you start to become a high-performing team, you're going to be going into a microservices kind of world because you have to do that to go fast. So that means you're going to have lots of things to release. That's good and bad. It's good because you're going quick and you can do experiments and you can try things out really quickly and get feedback, which is great. What's bad is without automation, you are kind of screwed. So it's one of those, let's just embrace the future. Let's use microservices and it's fine, but let's focus on automating deployment. So automate deployment. Let's try not to use snapshots if you can. Trunk-based development, this is another one that, so this is not me making all this up, right? This is the book. This is the book saying all this, so please don't attack me for, if you disagree with these things. So the book says these are all things high-performance teams do. The other one is trunk-based development. So this is a very semi-religious thing that some developers get very upset about. Long-term feature branches are not high-performing teams uh, features, uh, things high-performing teams do. In other words, trunk-based development, having one branch that you, everyone merges code to all the time, continuous integration, that's kind of what it means, continuously integrating all the code together into a branch, one branch. Continuously integrating code into master is the high performing team way of doing it. Now, a lot of development teams love the idea of long-term feature branches. It's like, well, we can all have a different feature and we've all got a different branch and we'll all mess around in our own little world. The problem is you're not merging or integrating anything together. You're basically not, you're doing infrequent integration. You're not continuously integrating, you're infrequently. 
And what often happens, you've probably all been there before if you use LinkedIn feature branches, you get the merge war thing. You've got like three massive feature branches. They've been going for three months each and you've reflected the crap out of the code. And the first person to merge makes lots of issues for the other three teams. You're like, you damn, you merge your thing. I've got to refactor my stuff now for weeks. It's going to be weeks to be able to merge this crap back together. So the more we use trunk-based development, we do lots of little changes, get it into master, lots of little changes, get it into master. You can do refactoring, you can do whatever, but get it into master quickly. The more we do that, we're saving the tech debt of having the merge wars or trying to merge these desperate code bases that have been completely isolated for a huge amount of time. Now, that doesn't mean branches are bad. So short-term branches are great, right? I'm working on a feature change. I've done a day's work. I'm going to propose this change. I've only spent half a day on it, a day maybe. Let's propose that and let's merge it quickly, right? So short-term feature branches, awesome. Long-term feature branches, not awesome. I know lots of you probably use them, but try just limit them and try them. And if you do use them, try do frequent continuous integrations of those branches. Try rebase them continuously. So at least you have a way of continuously integrating. But increasingly we're thinking feature flags are better, just keep merging things to master and use branch by edge abstraction and that kind of stuff. So everything's in master so you don't have this merge hell, right? This merge hell is hell. So try do true. Basically, if you can do all of these things, you become high performing, but at least if you do some of this, you become higher performing. So don't aim for everything from day one, just gradually try and do more and more of these things. So try and automate your CI and CD. I'll show you how to do that for real in a minute. Um, try and do continuous integration properly and continuously do automated releases and deployments and stuff. Um, Lucy coupled architecture. What we really want to do is empower our teams to be empowered to deliver value without sitting in committees for months on end trying to decide what to do. Let, let empower development teams to go off and try and solve the business problems. What you need to figure out what the business problems are first, but once you've figured out the business problems, let teams go off and pull pieces of that functionality off and try and implement it themselves. So this is the kind of the new world we're all trying to be. We're trying to be high performing teams. We're trying to use the cloud well. We're trying to use microservices. We're trying to, what does use the cloud well mean? probably means using containers because containers are cheaper than VMs and they're smaller and lighter weight and easier to work with than VMs. So that means we probably want to do Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is a, is a fairly big thing. I'm a huge Kubernetes fan. Um, I, I would highly recommend everybody at least tries to learn a little bit about Kubernetes because it's, it's an amazing thing of beauty. And you learn an amazing amount of just by playing around with Kubernetes and learning a little bit about how it works and why it works, how it works, um, I learned a ton about how to do distributed applications well. In many ways, Kubernetes is like a, it's a pattern for how to build distributed applications. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So even if you still have lots of VMs in your organization and using some containers and some VMs, Learning a bit more about Kubernetes is a great investment in your career, I think, because it really helps you figure out how to do uh, distributed applications really well. So please look at Kubernetes. We don't need to worry about how it works. Basically, Kubernetes is like this magic stuff that runs your stuff in a cloud, right? That's basically it. It runs your stuff in a cloud. Let's imagine you're writing Java applications. You've got a Tomcat thing with some wall in there and some Java code, and you want to run it in the cloud. You probably want to want more than one process, right? Most systems people expect to be elastic and highly available. So you probably don't want to run one JVM with one Tomcat and one machine if this is kind of like production. You're probably going to want a cluster of machines, like lots of machines running your Tomcat thing. You probably want to elastically scale it up and down based on the HTTP requests that come in. Kubernetes can just do all of that for you, right? So Kubernetes is a way of packaging up your code as a Docker image, and you tell Kubernetes to run your stuff, and it will scale it up, it will scale it down, it will do a little balancing, it can do a, lots of other things like dealing with persistent state, persistent volumes, dealing with DNS and networking and load balancing and service discovery and all kinds of things. But basically, Kubernetes is an is a industry standard open source way of running processes on a bunch of boxes. And those boxes could be in your data center, they could be on any public cloud, on any hybrid cloud. It's awesome, right? It's basically how we should deploy and build most applications. I'm going to do a talk after this talk about serverless, which is a slightly different uh, twist on this. But for now, let's forget serverless. Let's just focus on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is awesome. You should all look at it. It's, it's truly amazing. So faced with this new world of we're all trying to be high performing teams. We're all trying to do microservices. We're all trying to automate CI and CD. And we're all trying to go fast and experiment and try things out with different microservices. 
how can we move forward and, and get all of this awesomeness really quickly? And this is the answer. This is the answer, Jenkins X. So the idea behind Jenkins X is um, we love Jenkins. Jenkins is this amazing box of Lego with uh, 2,000 plugins in there that can do all kinds of stuff. And you can plug that together in any kind of way, which is great. However, in this new world, we don't want everyone to have to be a Jenkins expert to know about the 2,000 plugins and how to plug the plugins together to do the thing. We want each team to go off and build microservices that solve the business problem. So we kind of want to hide the CI and CD. I'm not saying CI and CD is not important. I'm not saying it's not, it, it's crucial, right? But what we're really trying to do with Jenkins X is take a more holistic top-down view. We're trying to just automate the CI and CD so the developers can just focus on writing that Spring Boot application, writing that Tomcat war thingy, writing the Node.js application on the Go or whatever it is, whatever kind of cool, funky library framework you're doing. Developers should be really focusing on that, and the CI and CD should just kind of work. So the idea behind Jenkins X is the CI and CD should just work, and you should just focus on uh, hacking your code and going quick. So that's the basic idea behind Jenkins X. So Jenkins X is completely open source, just like Jenkins. Uh, think of it as the kind of the next generation Jenkins, kind of. It's trying to reimagine the idea of Jenkins in, the, in this new microservice cloud native world. So what does it do? How does it help? So the first thing, if you start using containers and Kubernetes on the public cloud, private cloud, on-premise, whatever, um, there's a whole bunch of tools you're gonna need to be able to use Kubernetes and Jenkins together or CI and CD together. So there's things like Docker registries and Nexus Artifactory and repositories for your charts if you're using charts from Helm and those kind of things. There's monitoring and management. There's a whole raft of different tools that you're gonna have to figure out how to install and configure on Kubernetes. So the first quick win of Jenkins X is it installs and configures everything you need to do CI and CD. So you don't need to worry about picking all these different tools and gluing them all together. Um, I could probably cry if I realized how much of, of my life I've spent configuring Jenkins and Nexus. Just that, just getting Jenkins and Nexus to talk to each other, to use one as a proxy cache for downloading artifacts and the other one to do releases and push it in. Just that one simple thing, I've wasted probably three months of my life in different jobs at different environments in different clusters just doing that. Like Jenkins X does that without even doing anything, right? That is one of the things. So it just it deals with Docker registries. If you're using Google Cloud, it will use GCL by default. If you're using Amazon, it will use ECL by default. If you're using Azure, it will use ACL by default. So you don't have to worry about how do you get your pipeline to talk to your container registry or your S3 bucket or your Nexus or your whatever. It does all of that stuff for you. So firstly, you don't have to uh, set up all your tools. Which is interesting, but it's not that interesting. What's more interesting is the next bit. It automates the CI and CD for all of your applications. So you don't have to sit there with a blank sheet of paper, well, electronic sheet of paper, to figure out what's the Jenkins pipeline I write for my new Spring microservice. The CI CD is automated for you. So you don't need to know anything about Docker and how to write a Docker file. You don't need to know anything about Kubernetes at all, really. You don't need to know what a Kubernetes uh, resource is for deploying things or creating load balances with services or ingress or any of that stuff. That's all automated. You don't need to know anything about Helm charts and how you can take Kubernetes YAML and package it into tables, which you can then version because the versioning artifacts is a big thing. So we like immutable versioned artifacts. So you don't need to know about any of that, that's all automated. So basically you just focus on your app and your code and the CI and CD is automated for you. Now, you might be hearing this thinking, oh my God, this sounds like another pass. It sounds like a lockdown kind of like horrible thing that if I just want an extra environment variable, I'm kind of screwed. Everything in Jenkins X is all in a Git repository. So we automate all of this stuff, the Docker file and the Helm and the CI CD pipeline, all this kind of stuff, we automate all of that stuff. But we're not taking anything away. We're not hiding anything. You don't need to know about any of these things, but they're right there if you want to look. So you can blissfully ignore the pipeline and the Docker file and the Helm and the Kubernetes, and you can just focus on your Spring Boot stuff. But if you really cared, you could modify the Docker file to change how you package your app with the Docker file, or you could change the Helm chart to package how you deploy your application into Kubernetes by using, I don't know, a secret or something, or a persistent volume, or some kind of funky Kubernetes thing. So over time, you have everything in your toolbox to use any capability of Kubernetes, the Kubernetes ecosystem, Helm, Docker, CI and CD. Everything's right there and it's all in Git, ready for you to modify if ever you see fit to do so. But you don't need to worry about that, or you don't need to worry about that yet. We're all on this uh, transformation journey. 
And it's going to take a while for all of us to pick up what the cloud means and how to use the cloud well and what containers are and how to use containers well and what Kubernetes is and what CICD are. There's a lot to take on. So one of the big things we're trying to do with Jamie's X is go relax, developer. Don't worry about that. We'll do that for you. You just focus on your Java code or your Node code or your whatever. If you're messing with the POM XML, you know, that's on you. That's not us. You, know, you figure out your POM XML stuff or whatever. But the rest of it will do that for you. But then if and whenever you want to change things, it's right there. You just need to change Git, but don't worry about it yet. And then gradually, we found teams can gradually <coughs> pick up the bits and bobs from what Kubernetes can do for you or what Docker can do for you or whatever. So the aim is to really get you going quickly by automating CI/CD. Um, another thing that's kind of new is we do the D. We don't just do CI, right? We're not just building tables or whatever. We're, we also can promote versions of your application to different environments. Right, now one of the, uh, so I, I'm kind of quite old and I've worked with lots of teams over the years. And what's really interesting is until the last couple of years, every team you go to, you say, how do you deploy your stuff? And the answer you next hear is completely random and different to everything you've ever heard of it. Well, we have a Perl script that calls some Ruby that then uses Ansible with a chef thing and then a bit of salt. And then after that, for some reason, we use Puppet. I'm not sure why, but somebody did that 10 years ago. The answer is always, uh, well, desperately sad, quite frankly, but it, it's bespoke. It's always 100% bespoke that every company has built their deployment mechanism by hand using a random selection of stuff from the shelf. And it kind of works, but it's kind of crappy. You say, do you like your stuff? No, that's no, terrible. Everyone hates it. It's shit. It's literally shit. So it's like, well, why do you get rid of it? Well, we don't have anything else. This is all we've got. This is all software, right? Every company, right now, when you get back to work tomorrow, ask your ops folks, so do you like your deployment stuff? That deployment stuff you do, what is it? Are you using an off-the-shelf tool? If you're lucky, it might be Ansible. I mean, Ansible's a good tool, right? Ansible's good, that, that's fine. But the answer is usually some weird, bespoke, scripty horribleness, right? It's terrible. One of the beautiful things about the standardization of the cloud and Kubernetes and containers is there's now one way to package up your application as a container, and there's one way to package it up so it runs on Kubernetes. And you can take that immutable versioned artifact and run it on Amazon, Google, Microsoft, OpenShift on premise, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, Pivotal Cloud. You can literally run that, and you, if you really want, you can do a DIY Kubernetes cluster and install it there. One thing I will say about Kubernetes, by the way, friends don't let friends install Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not this Java minus Jar Jenkins the War thing. It's not a trivial little one line command to boot up uh, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, is amazing and it's awesome, but it's doing networking and DNS and storage and security and firewalls and oh my god, it's doing all kinds of stuff. It's not some like gentle little binary you just kind of run and it just works. It's hard to install and manage. So please try and outsource that shit. This is using the cloud well, right? Using the cloud well is not. I know, let's build our own data center and let's manage the hardware ourselves or let's change the disks if the disk breaks. No, using the cloud well is let's outsource that stuff too. You know, IBM, Oracle, Red Hat, Microsoft, Google, Azure, pick somebody, just pick somebody. This is now commodity stuff, right? This is commodity stuff. There's no need to manage that shit yourself, right? So please outsource that to somebody. Doesn't really matter who. If, you, if I was to recommend someone, I would say, start with Amazon, Microsoft, Google. All of them have an on-premise story now. Like a lot of people say, oh, I can't use the public cloud because we've got to be on-premise. Uh, GKE on-premise is public and GA this year. GKE on-premise is the same as GKE, which is amazing. You click a button and you've got a cluster, and then you can scale it up and down whenever you want. You can run it forward and backwards in Kubernetes versions. You can say, okay, just auto-scale my cluster. I don't know how many machines I want. Just auto-scale the cluster, and I'll just run stuff. And then Google, you figure that stuff out. Just build me whatever I use. It's amazing, and GKE on-premise works on your premise. You just give it hardware, and it's the same thing. So if I had to pick something, GKE on-premise is amazing, and GKE public cloud is amazing. But uh, Azure has a similar thing as your stack. Amazon nearly has something like that, and you'll have something like that fairly soon, but you know that's probably slightly behind. But go for one of those big three. One of the Amex Red Hat, so I don't want to talk too much about Red Hat right now, but um, I if you're going to pick something for the first time ever, I would focus on public cloud first. Most of us are going to run a lot of our stuff in the public cloud. Now, a lot of people have to have some stuff in custom data centers for security and whatever. But you start talking to, for example, talk to most fairly leading investment banks, for example. 
massively regulated security is really, really important. Is that using public cloud? Yes. In fact, we're trying to go all in. Most of the leading investment banks are trying to go all in on the public cloud all the time. Now, are they going to be able to do that across every market and every business segment in the next year? No. But they've already got lots of public cloud stuff in lots of financial applications already today. So most businesses can go public cloud. But I understand this is a touchy subject because people get a bit worried about public cloud. So at least if you're going to do on-premise, try to go with the cloud vendors. So at least you have the option to cloud burst some stuff. For example, do all of your development testing in the public cloud and just have production on-premise. You don't need to have everything on-premise. Right, focus on what needs to be on-premise and what's on public. And if you're using the public cloud vendor, it's the same thing, whether it's on-premise or public. It doesn't matter which region, zone, data center rack it, it runs in, it's the same management console and tools that runs everywhere, right? And Google, Microsoft, Azure, they manage it all for you. So my tech would be good for one of those big three, but you know, they're still pivotal, they're still IBM, they're still Oracle, you know, there are still others. Anyways, okay, I, I should speed this up, by the way. Uh, so I haven't got to the demo yet. Um, so we do something called GitHub. So when we're doing deployments, traditionally, there's been this kind of hot sea of mess and shell script and stuff, which is fine. Now we have Kubernetes, we have a canonical way of deploying things, which is great. However, okay, so one way you could do this. Uh, so with Kubernetes, you can connect to Kubernetes uh, uh, clusters and you can do stuff like uh, you can create things, you can delete things from the command line, which is, you know, awesome. So just imagine we're all on one team together and I log in and I delete some stuff. Um, you and I've got no idea well, all of a sudden production is down and it's dead because I just deleted something, but you, you're not watching my terminal. I hope you're not watching my terminal. So you're not watching my terminal, so you have no idea. So we, we, we want to get away from this one person logging into production and doing something on their command line and it's breaking things. What we kind of want to do is get into the way that we use Git for managing our environments. We all know that using source control for code is great because we can review it. We can see who changed what when. We can do things like run uh, CI on changes to see is this a good change or a bad change. We can do code reviews on it. We can have votes. I need two plus ones to get to production. So by using Git for environments, it means all of the configuration for everything in production is in the Git repository. So all the versions of all the microservices that are running there, all the environment specific details for that production install is in the Git repository. So if I come along and say, I need a new version of cheese, I'm making a pull request on the Git repository that everyone else in the team can look at and go, nah, that looks a bit risky to me, or maybe we should do some more testing, or we can have a discussion on the pull request and we can debate and then we can try it. And if it goes bad, we can revert because it's Git, so we can go forwards and backwards at any point in time. So the idea of GitOps is let's use Git and source control for managing all of your environments. So staging gets a Git repository, production gets a Git repository. Every change in production is versioned. If all of a sudden at 12 o'clock on a Tuesday, production goes down, you can see, let's look at the Git log. It was James again with this crazy new version of something that kind of broke everything. Let's just revert that thing. So it gives you this really easy way of managing change because everything's versioned and everything's audited. You know, who changes what when? And it stops developers just tinkering. And developers just going in and I'm just going to make this one change and I will do it properly later, but I'm just going to change it now. And you never change it later. And then people forget what you did and everything becomes a snowflake. So GitOps is a very simple, simple, simple idea, but it's amazingly powerful. It's amazingly powerful. It just helps everyone go faster. It reduces stress. It gives you, it empowers us to go faster because we've always got the safety net to go backwards. And sometimes it's, you might have to go back three times. Like we've done four changes today, but it's still not really working. Why don't we just go back to yesterday? So you can go forwards and backwards as many changes as you like. Sometimes you go, oh my God, production, it doesn't seem to be working, but staging is awesome. Let's do a div because it's two Git repositories and we know how to do divs because it's all the source code. So by using source code for uh, environments, it's a very small, simple idea, but it's amazingly powerful and productive. So GitOps is awesome. And feedback. Um, we need huge amounts of feedback. We need more feedback than we have already to help us understand when changes are good and when changes are bad. So this is really what we're trying to do. Automate CI and CD and go faster and use GitOps. So a quick intro in how to use Jenkins X and I'll do a quick, hopefully a live demo on the public cloud. Uh, we'll see how that works. Um, so the first thing, if you're looking at Jenkins X and want to give it a try, you need a little binary called JX for Jenkins X. It's a JX binary. Uh, you can click on that URL and download it. Um, we have a binary for like Windows, Linux, and Mac. It's a single static binary, and it just starts up really quick. It's really nice. 
Um, so once you've got the binary installed, you've then got two options. Um, you can do JX create cluster, or you can do JX install if you already have a Kubernetes cluster. Now we really recommend you do the JX create cluster command just because we know, because JX is creating the cluster, we know the cluster's gonna be good. Not all Kubernetes clusters are equal, right? Some clusters have really tiny machines, some have horrendous firewalls that don't let you use anything useful. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with Kubernetes. So at least if we do the first option, we know it's gonna work because we made the cluster and it's got all the right defaults and stuff. JX install is probably gonna work, but you know, people do crazy stuff. So if someone in your organization has made a weird and wonderful Kubernetes cluster, it might work, it might work, but we're not quite sure. So we'd rather you do the first one and be happy and have a useful time and use the cloud well. The second option can work. We do have a compliance test suite. If you do JX compliance, there's a way of running a, a, a Kubernetes compliance test on your Kubernetes cluster. So we'll tell you why it won't work if it won't work. Um, but yeah, hopefully start with the first one. By the way, JX create cluster, GKE, the, the, the GKE word is interchangeable. You can do EKS for Amazon, uh, AWS for COPS on Amazon, EKS for, now I've got to remember acronyms, AKS for Azure, GKE is Google Cloud, their, their managed offering. We have, I have, PKS, I think, for Pivotal, IEK something for IBM, and there's one for Oracle, but I can't remember the acronym, but it starts with an O, O something, something. Um, so we have a lot of different commands that will boot stuff up on the different clouds. Um, we've tried to make every install for every cloud use the cloud well for that cloud. So we try and use the Docker registry for that provider. We try and use whatever facilities are in the box for that cloud so that you don't have to worry about changing and configuring Jenkins X, basically. So that one command gives you a Kubernetes cluster and Jenkins X installed on it. Here's an hour oh, going off in the demo. This is a slightly old video of how to install Jenkins X on GKE. So you type JX create cluster GKE, it asks you a few questions like which zones do you want to run it in, which, how many nodes do you want to use, which kind of machine sizes. And then you hit return a few times. This is sped up slightly. It takes like two to three minutes uh, on a reasonable network to, to run. Um, I didn't want to do this live because it is a bit of a dull demo to watch this live. So two to three minutes in GKE, it's pretty snappy. Uh, EKS is about 30 minutes because it took quite a while to get the Kubernetes cluster on EKS. Um, this isn't a real cluster anymore, so don't worry about that password, uh, it doesn't work. Um, so basically it installs the Kubernetes cluster, it stores then all the Jenkins X stuff in the cluster, so there'll be like a Jenkins and a Nexus and those little bits and bobs. And then by the end of this uh, output, you're ready to go and you're ready to use uh, Jenkins X to do stuff. So. How do we use Jenkins X to you do stuff? So what does an install give you? So the most important thing, oh, go on, It's question. already uh, available through uh, Brew. Already available for? Uh, through, uh, by uh, Brew. 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 Oh, Brew. 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 Oh, sorry, there's a Brew. You can do Brew install for JX, yes. Okay. Do Brew install and that will down JX, yes, sorry. And there's a chocolatey for Windows. <laughs> I, I'm not a Windows person, I don't even know what that means, but there's a package manager for Windows called chocolate or chocolatey or something. So you can, if you're a Windows person, you can use chocolate or chocolatey, and there's a brew if you're a Mac um, So yeah, so you install Jenkins X. What does that give you? One of the most important things is each development team in Jenkins X gets their own environments. So you get your own development environments to do build and test and run pipelines, and you get your own staging environments to deploy your code, and you get your own production environments. Now, what we want to encourage is teams to use the cloud well and be a high performing team and start by going to staging and ideally production very quickly. What we've seen happen before in teams is people go, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll make a container like in a few months. I'm just gonna like polish this code first. And you sit there polishing code for months before you try and make it into a container and then before you try and run it on the cloud. What we want to encourage is to people do it the other way. The first thing you do is deploy your code into the cloud and, and it, see it running and see it fine, and then you make small incremental changes and each time check it still works. If you do it that way around, as soon as you break something, as soon as something goes wrong, you go, oh, that one little change. When I deleted that innocent looking environment variable, suddenly you know, I know what I did that, that broke it. If you sit there messing around for three months and then try and make a container and then try and run it in the cloud, you're gonna have weeks and weeks of pain of knowing something I did in the last three months uh, broke it. Who knows what they did two weeks ago? I don't have a clue. Like, trying to remember all the changes you do over three months is a nightmare, right? And going through all of your Git history and stuff, it's a nightmare. So what we really want to encourage is start going straight to staging, and then just keep going to staging every time you make a code change. Go to staging, go to staging, and then ideally production. 
<laughs> and then keep, keep, keep doing that. So we want each development team to have their own development, staging, and production environments. Uh, Kubernetes has a, has a thing called namespaces that lets you take a physical cluster and logically split it up into logical separate pieces. So you can say, here's one cluster, and I'm going to have logical production, logical staging, and logical development. And each one is a namespace, which means within that namespace, you only see services in your namespace. So any app running in production can't see the staging database. Any app running in staging can't see the production database. We've often, before Kubernetes, we often did this dollar squiggly stuff where we had dollar squigglies. If you're a Spring person, you know what the dollar squigglies are, but for everyone else, in, let's say environment variables, you have environment variables everywhere that says, what is, where is the production cluster? Where is the staging cluster? And we've all forgot to change one of the strings and have something in staging when it gets production and think bad things have happened. One of the beautiful things Kubernetes does is it does service discovery properly. So you just refer to your things as DNS names and the DNS naming works so that production DNS resolves, <laughs> staging DNS resolves, development resolves, the same binary will work in all three environments and use the right stuff. So you don't have all this weird complexity of config management and just horrendous crap that is error prone and always breaks. So service discovery is awesome in Kubernetes. So each developer gets all the development tools they need, the elastic CI CD cloud of doing builds and pipelines and stuff, all the tools they need like a Docker registry and an artifact repository and a staging and a production environment. So um, I've probably been talking way too crocky, yes, I have. Um, so then here's how you kind of use Jenkins X. So one of the uh, issues with uh, all this Kubernetes stuff is that people go, oh my God, so I need to learn Kubernetes now, and then Docker, and then, then this Jenkins X thing. One of the great things is that one person in your team can install Jenkins X, and then everyone else can just use it, right? And the only other thing, once someone's installed Jenkins X for you, all you need to do is somebody on your team needs to run one of these commands to create a brand new project or import some code. Once that one command of those three is done, everything else is just git, right? You just edit code and source control, good stuff happens. You don't need to worry about all this Kubernetes and containers and CI CD. So the really nice thing to remember in all of this is most of our developers won't need to know or care about Docker or Kubernetes or even Jenkins X. Once you've imported a project or created a project, you just use Git, you just use your IDE of choice and just hack code and make pull requests. All of the other magic just takes, takes place by magic and you don't need to worry about it. But to start the magic, you need to do one of these three commands. Somebody in your team needs to run one of these three commands for each microservice you make. I should hack this slide because really we'd like you to start at the bottom, not the top. So if you're starting a brand new Spring Boot application, type JX create Spring, it will make a brand new Spring Boot application. And then you have an empty Spring Boot application which is deployed to staging automatically and then you can just start editing it to add code and add dependencies and whatnot. If you're not a Spring Boot shop and you use something else like Node or Angular or uh, Rust or Python or PHP or .NET or all sorts of other stuff, there's JX Quick Quick Start where we have a whole raft of Quick Start microservices that use lots of different kind of technologies and languages and frameworks and build tools. If you start with a Quick Start, you then get a Node.js application or a whatever it is, Go application or something. And then you start with a working application that's running in staging and all the CI CD is working, and then you can start iterating on the source code <laughs> and actually run your business logic. If you already have some code, you can type JX info. Um, I would recommend the first time you try this, try one of these two, because it will definitely work. It's a bit like the JX create thing. Try these two at the bottom, because those always work. JX import will probably work. But there's a lot of things people can do in their POMXML and their Jenkins file and their Docker file and their Helm charts. So it might be the stuff you're doing is a bit weird and our pipelines don't quite work and we'd have to work on it to fix them. So the JX import will probably work. Like if you import a Spring Boot app, it will just totally work. If you import a flat class path executable jar, it will probably work. If you import a crazy ear using an old version of WebLogic, it probably will work. But we can make it work fairly easily by just hacking the code a bit. So just be aware that JX import doesn't always work for all projects, but it will probably work for most modern projects, right? Most node things, most Spring Boot stuff will just work. So three commands. Those three commands just basically set up the project and set up the CI CD. From there, it's just source control and like developer stuff with IDs from then on. So at that point, let me do a live demo of all this stuff <laughs> because this all sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It sounds amazing. So uh, I'm on the internet, that's good. 
So I'm going to do almost all of this from the command line to show there's no weird magic going on. Um, I've created a, a cluster last week on GKE. If I do JX uh, get env for the get environments, this should show me which environments I've got. Great, that's working. The internet's there, that's brilliant. So these are all the environments I've got in my cluster. You can see there's two environments staging and production, and there's the Git repositories for them. We'll come to that in a minute. Don't worry too much about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by creating a Spring Boot application. Um, let's do JX create Spring. And then it's going to ask me which username I'll use my personal one, um, which organization, in, in this case, I'm using GitHub. We support GitHub, Bitbucket Server, Bitbucket Cloud, GitLab. There's another one, I've forgotten. Yeah, all well, well, those. Uh, I'm sure there's more. Um, what do I want to call this repository? Oh, that's a good name. Holland Rocks, because I can't spell you, Chuck. Uh, Holland Rocks. Uh, obviously, Groovy is the best. Uh, let's go with Java. Java's good. A lot of people know Java. Uh, and then this is the group ID. Let's go with the default. Now, this is a Spring Boot thing. It's asking, what are the Spring Boot dependencies? This is a Spring Boot thing. If you don't know Spring Boot, don't worry about this. This is a Spring Boot thing. If you use start.spring.io, you'll know all about this. These are the Spring Boot dependencies that you can opt into in your application that we're going to create. I'm going to pick Actuator. Actuator is really useful because it makes something called a health check. And health checks are really good in Kubernetes. I'll talk, talk about that later. Uh, and then I'm going to pick the web component. So I'll pick Actuator and web. Now it's going to create a project on my file system. Would I like to initialize Git? Yes, please. What's the commit message? Oh, it's fine. If in doubt with JGSX, just keep hitting return. Whenever it asks you something, just hit return and it'll probably do the right thing. Um, so now what it's done is it's created a sample project on my file system. It's now running the build pack to look at the build pack and go, has it got a pipeline? Has it got a Docker file? Has it got a Helm chart? Oh, it's done it. Okay. And then it's uh, pushed that to GitHub um, and it set up the CI and CD. So now we're good. We have CI and CD, we've got a Spring Boot application, we have a Git repository, and we're all done. Right? One command, JX create Spring. That was pretty cool, right? So we can use one command to create a Spring Boot application, one command to create a quick start in another programming language, and one command to import some code. Right? One command, that's it. So it might have looked really busy. I basically just typed one command and then hit return. That's all I really did, hit return. You might need to name the project, but apart from naming the project, you just hit return. Now let me show you what actually happened behind the curtain. Uh, by the way, I'm going to type this command in because it's kind of cool. This command is going to visualize the pipeline running in my terminal. So you can kind of see what it's doing in the background. And I'll show you what's happened in the background and then we'll hopefully see some awesomeness in a minute. So let me click on this URL. So this is the Git repository that we just created. So just to show you, this is github.com. I'm not making this up. This is like the real github.com. You can see in the, in the top there, github.com. That's my personal user, Holland Rocks. And this is the source code of the Spring Boot application. It's not the most, this is just vanilla Spring Boot application code, so it's not you know, too interesting. It's a Hello World Spring Boot application, nothing too uh, amazing. But you might notice there's a bunch of other files that have been generated here. It's not just Spring. There's a Jenkins file created. So the Jenkins file contains the CI/CD pipeline for this project. There's a Docker file created, which is, specifies how to take this Java code and make it into a Docker container. So here's the Docker file. I don't know if you've ever looked at a Docker file, but this is a, a bit bigger. This is a very fairly simple Docker file where you've got a base image. We're going to copy uh, the lib into the lib directory and copy the jar into the folder, and we're going to run Java basically minus jar. Simple. So a simple Docker file that takes the Java code, puts it in the Docker image, and then makes a Docker container. Uh, we've got the Jenkins file as well. We could look at that if we like. Um, and what happens is whenever we push to master, so what we did, we type one command, we generate the Git repository, we've applied the build pack to it. We registered the webhooks in the Git repository, so it triggers Jenkins. Whenever we push to master or create a pull request, it's going to trigger a pipeline. Now, we know, because we've just merged to master, it's going to create a new release. Uh, and it's going to create a new version release. So if I click on the releases button, let's see how quick this is going to be. You see there's no releases yet. The pipeline is chugging along a little bit. It's, it's slower than normal. So the first thing it's going to do is going to check out all the code. It's going to run the unit test, to check everything is still building and compiling and everything. Then it's going to generate a new version number for the project. It's going to tag Git with that version number. So we're going to have a real version number. It's going to make the jar with that version. It's going to make the Docker image with that version. It's going to push the jar to Nexus. It's going to push the Docker image to the Docker registry. It's going to make something called the Helm chart, which is a Kubernetes version tarball of YAML stuff that you can apply to any Kubernetes cluster to install and run your application. So you can take that Helm chart and install it in any Kubernetes cluster anywhere in the known world and it will just start up instantly. So it's going to do all of that. Any second now, it's going a little bit slow. 
Uh, so any second now we should see a git tag. Of, there we go, we've got a git tag. So it's created a git tag 001. And a question I often get is, what happens if I want to go from 001 to 100? So we use git tags to do the versioning. So if you ever want to jump from a patch version to a micro version to a macro version or a major version, you can just create a git tag. Create a git tag 1.0.minus1 and it will do 100 next. So you can use git tags to change the version number. You can change your pomxml if you really want. If you want to do a big jump, you can edit your pomxml. Often your pomxml says 0.1 snapshot or whatever. You can do 1.0 snapshot and then the next version will use pomxml. If you're a node person, you can use the package JSON and use, change that. So if you really want, you can do a code change to your pomxml or your node package JSON, or, or you can just uh, use a git tag. So we increase the version. It's chugging along quite slow. Hmm. Okay, it's done the release. So now it's promoting. Okay, cool. So what it does is it generates version artifacts for everything. So we have an immutable versioned jar, docker image, and Helm jar. Then it does the promotion via GitOps. Now, one thing that's interesting about Jenkins X is we've separated promotion from releasing. So anybody can promote any version of anything at any point in time, irrespective of the CI/CD pipeline. However, what we also do by default is whenever we do a release of something, we promote to all of the environments you've marked as automatic promotion. So the out-of-the-box defaults, which you can change, you can have as many environments as you wish, and each environment can use whatever policies you want. But the out-of-the-box default is staging uses automatic promotion. So every time you release a new version, it's automatically promoted to staging. And we've kept production as a manual promotion. So nothing goes from to production until you decide it goes there. Right. So you choose to promote whenever you're ready by running the command line and it will do a generate pull request and promote. Now what we'd like you all to do is automate production as well. Right? What we really want is every code change, once it's green and we're ready to merge it, we want that code change going straight to production automatically. Right? We want to get rid of as many of these human decisions as we can so we can go faster. However, most teams are a little bit nervous of going straight to production on a code change. For example, without any kind of system testing, uh, you know, you kind of feel like you need a, a, a big enough amount of testing before you feel confident enough to go straight to production. So we've left the defaults as we go automatically to, automatically to staging and then it's manual to go to production, but you can change that whenever you like. You can have as many environments as you like and you can promote forwards and backwards whenever you choose to. Now, have you noticed that pull request? So this is how we're promoting to the staging environment. So let me click on that pull request. So click on that link. So this is a GitHub pull request. And notice the repository at the top. This is my staging repository. So the staging, we have a Git repository for the staging environment for my team. Now let me just explain this because some people get confused. We don't want a Git repository for every application and every environment. We just have an, a Git repository for all of staging. So this one Git repository contains all the apps that run in staging. So if I've got 100 microservices, they're all configured in this one Git repository. So if, I, if I've got 100 services uh, dynamically releasing all the time, we'll just get lots and lots of pull requests on this one Git repository. Right? So it's, this one Git repository runs everything in staging for one team. Now we would like each team to have its own environments. And the main reason we want that is it removes friction. Um, and it also helps role-based authentication. Kubernetes has role-based authentication built in, which is amazing. So for example, uh, I could invite four of you to have right access to my staging environment, but only let everyone else have read access. So you can have very fine grained access of who can read and write all the different resources in Kubernetes, which is great. But once you have, say, 10 teams, you don't want one team editing another team's stuff because that team doesn't even know what the other team's doing. So it's good to segregate teams' work so that each team works in its own little world, each team owns its own stuff, and different teams just share services, but they don't actually control each other's services. Right? Um, oh, I was talking too long then. So we generate the pull request, and it's already merged, you might have noticed, which is a bit too quick. Um, so let me show you the pull request. So the pull request is a code change that was automatically generated to use the new Holland Rocks microservice version 001. And let me show the diff. So the diff of this is three lines of YAML. So these three lines of declarative YAML says, use this new app called Holland Rocks. That's the repository it comes from, and then that's the version 001. Now, because we've never deployed this application before, there's three lines to change. The name of the app, where the app comes from, and the version. Once we do another version of Holland Rocks, there's only one line to change, the version number. So normally, once you create an app, all that changes is the version number. 
Now, sometimes you might also change environment configuration. You might have a specific environment variable in a specific environment, which is another complete change, which is a slightly different complete change, but that's a, a, that would just be a simple pull request as well, right? So usually, all that happens is the environment, the version number changes. Now, so what we did, we created a brand new application, it released a new version, it automated the generation of a pull request, which then merged, and I think by now, should have deployed the application. So now the application is running live and staging. Now that might seem as a slightly overkill, but what's amazing is now we have an automated CICD pipeline that whenever anybody merges to master, we're going to make a new version number. We're going to have new immutable artifacts for the jars and the POM XML and the Docker image and the Helm chart. And we're going to promote it with the same automated pipeline to staging. And at any point in time, anybody can do a pull request to go backwards, to add more applications, to remove applications, to go forwards and backwards and whenever. So it's really, really nice. And let me just show you the application running. Let's check it's all actually working. Now, you might think that's not working. That, that honestly is what a Spring Boot application looks like before you write any code. So that is really, really working, honestly. Really, really. That is not, I know it says 404, but that means we haven't written a RESTful endpoint yet, so there's nothing to show on the homepage. So that's, honestly, that's, that's, that's good, that's a win. We even we have a bunch of BDD tests that test creating all these different clusters and creating all these different uh, quick starts and stuff. And we had to change the code of our test that if it's Spring, success is a 404, because it's the only framework that 404 is actually the answer on the Hello World. Everything else is a 200, though. So we had to uh, bless Spring, I love Spring, but yeah, the 404 is harsh. So uh, let me show you ha what happens when you start coding. Right? Let me show you quickly. I'm slightly over time for my first talk, but I can, I can always do a little bit less in my second talk. So I'm just going to keep going on this demo just for another like, 10 minutes. Um, let me show you how you do like pull requests, like how you do like interactive development. So I'm going to do all this. Again, I could do this in, in, uh, in an IDE. We have a plugin for Jenkins X for IntelliJ and VS Code. We've almost got one for Eclipse. We haven't ever quite got to finish in it, but it's close. Uh, so you can watch all of this rather than the command line in, a, in a, uh, your IDE. We've got a new web-based uh, UI coming soon from CloudBees that's going to be a, a, a freemium uh, UI you can use with Jenkins X. That's going to come out at some point, um, hopefully soon, because it's pretty awesome. Oh, wrong uh, thing. It was Holland Rocks, wasn't it? That was it. Holland Rocks. So here's the source code for the application. It's on my file system. Uh, or, I, or if you were someone else in my team, you'd just do a git clone from the git repository. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a branch. Um, I know I said short term, so I'm going to make a short term branch. Short -term branch. Uh, so I'm going to do a git checkout minus b changes. So I've made a new branch. Now I'm going to copy a file I made earlier that makes a better home page. If I if I can type, I don't think anybody else has a Mac. My keys have started falling off on my Mac, so it makes typing really tricky. Uh, okay, source folder. Oh, I forgot the recursive thingy minus there. And if I do git status, status is really hard because the S and the T have fallen off. <laughs> okay, uh, git add source da, 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 completion. Okay, I've, I've, if I do a git status again, I added one HTML file, right? So that's amazing coding, live coding of one HTML. <laughs> so now I'm going to do a git commit. I'll do it, I'll keep it real, I'll do it by hand, uh, da, 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 and I'll do better home page. Okay, okay I've done a git commit, I'll do a git push. So I made a code change in a temporary branch and I pushed it to GitHub. Now I could use the GitHub UI to create a pull request. I could use an IDE to create a pull request. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to use JX to create a pull request just because I can. It took me a few hours to write this piece of code. Uh, so I've created a pull request. You, you can create a pull request anytime, anywhere you like, really. It's just a pull request. If I click on a pull request, this is just a normal GitHub pull request. Uh, we can create pull requests on GitHub and GitLab and Bit buggy client, bit buggy server, and I'm sure there's another Git before I die. I've totally forgotten right now. Um, if I go back to this window, oh no, that one's. If I do uh, JX grip, uh, is it that? Yeah, that one. If I do that command again <coughs> to watch the pipeline, you'll see, notice another pipeline has started. Uh, Holland Rocks PR1. So because I've created a pipeline, so we have two pipelines basically for each application. Whenever you merge to master, we do a new release. So we create a new version and we release that new version and then promote a new version. If you create a pull request, we have another pipeline that runs, but it's a different kind of pipeline. 
when we do pull requests, we don't want to promote that to staging because we haven't agreed to merge it yet, right? All I've done is propose a code change. So pull request is, you are proposing a code change, and the idea with the pull request is, rather than just committing to master, we're saying to the team, I'm thinking of doing this change, what do you think? And it gives the team a chance to look at it and do a review, right? Now, code reviews are a, a personal or team decision. Some teams mandate code reviews, which is great. Some teams are like, well, I might just have a quick look, but anyway, whatever. But at least it gives you a choice that if your team is doing code reviews, they get a chance to at least do it. It gives you a chance to see what's happening. And it avoids people just committing random stuff. It gives you a chance to at least go, I'm not too sure about that code. Let's maybe change this piece. So by creating a pull request, it gives your team a chance to look at the code. Now, if I look at the pull request itself, you'll see there's a, see the pipeline is running? So we do the normal CI stuff where we build the code, do the unit test pass, does it compile, all the usual kind of stuff. But we also do something else at the end. We do something called a preview environment. So imagine you're working on the web UI and one of your team edits the CSS. Now, I don't know how good your CSS is, but if I look at a different CSS, I'm like, I have no clue. That might be awesome. That might look like crap. I literally have no clue. So particularly with HTML layouts and CSS and UIs, to review a code change, looking at the source code diff isn't awesome. What you kind of want to do is just look at the app and just see the app running. So what we do is whenever we, all the test paths and the code compilers and all that kind of stuff, we basically create a dynamic environment for the lifetime of each pull request. So we create a brand new environment, we deploy that, we build that code, make a new preview Docker image, we make a preview chart and we deploy that chart into a preview environment. And then we comment on the pull request, a link to the app running in the preview environment. <coughs> so it's a really simple idea, but this preview thing, once you start using these previews, you can never go back. If ever someone takes your preview away, you get really angry and cross because it gives you a really quick way of just giving something a once over. You don't have to go through every single line of source code, particularly with CSS and HTML and stuff, that kind of gets old quick. But it gives you a way of going, we said make the build button bigger. You moved it off the screen. I can't even see the build button. Right? It gives you a quick way of looking. Does this help us deliver the business value? Yes or no? That build button looks like crap. It's blinking. Like we didn't blink it. It's so nice. It's over there. Right? It gives you a way of reviewing the code change, which is awesome. Oh, uh, after you see this finished story, I was talking to Ron again. So the CI job finished, it compiled, it, you know, all the test passes, so that's all good. So, and it's gone green, the, the pipeline's gone green, everything's passed. And you see PR is built in the build in the preview environment there. And it's got a little URL. And if I click on the URL, this is the same microservice running, but now it's got a HTML page. It's got an awesome JK text HTML page. So now we don't have a 404 because we actually have something to serve. So now you can look at it. Now we haven't noticed anything yet, right? This is a short-term temporary branch. It's a proposal. You might hit the Jenkins X logo and go, this is wrong for our e-portal selling shoes. Uh, so you might want to disagree with this pull request and you reject it, which is fine. It's a discussion. We're, we're experimenting here. But this gives you a, your team a quick way of reviewing and another way of reviewing code changes. Now, what's interesting is we first did this for building UIs because we wanted to see the effect of code changes before we agreed to merge them. And what we found was when we first started Jenkins X, we've been on our own kind of digital transformation journey. What we thought was, when we merge the pull request, we should do a release, and then that release should go into the testing environment, and then we should test it. And we should do load testing and sub testing and security vulnerability testing. And then what happened is, we realized one of our tests failed. And then we're like, oh shit, we merged the master already. We broke master, master's now broken. We now have to fix master before we do anything else. So suddenly we have to like pull the cards and stop everything. Oh, stop, master's broken, damn tools everyone. Everyone stop doing what they're doing. Let's all fix master and fix this because we can't do anything else until master's back again. What we then realized, because we've got preview environments, why do we do our testing in the preview environment? So if you want to do Selenium or Cypress testing on your web app, if you want to do load testing, soap testing, secure vulnerability testing, OWASP testing, load testing, soap testing, whatever kind of testing you want, do it in the preview environment. Why? Because it's parallel. If you've got three developers all doing two, two pull requests a day, you get a sequencing problem with one test environment, right? One test environment, like, well, if, imagine one test takes 12 hours to run. You're like, so you can do two changes a day then forever? Like it's kind of, it's a very simple queuing theory. I mean, I don't know much about queuing theory, but at least I get that. You've got one test environment, it takes 12 hours to test. You can do two commits a day. I mean, that's, for some teams, that's a lot of work, but for some of the teams, that's, I changed the readme. Jesus, you know, so, 
being able to parallelize your testing, right, and opt in and opt out of testing and deciding which test to do. One thing we've found ourselves doing now is, is we, we've started to use chat, so I'm getting slightly off topic now, but we're using chat ops now to decide what tests to run on these pull requests. So sometimes you literally are changing a readme and you're saying, I don't need a 12 hour SOAP test on this readme change because it's a readme. And that doesn't even go in the binary. Sometimes you're like, I just changed the security thing. I think we need to properly run every scanny thing we've done ever because there could be a new hole because I don't even know what, what might be effect of this. So depending on the code change, you can opt in and out of different kinds of levels of testing. How does this work? So, well, where we're going with is the idea of um, we have a chatbot that lets you add and remove comments on issues, which then create labels on GitHub or GitLab or Gitia or Bitbucket. And um, we're just making the pipe, we have a step in our pipeline that can turn labels on a pull request into environment variables. And then every programming language and testing thing can look at an environment variable to decide whether to run a test or not. So long running tests, you can hide them behind a label. So you, by adding a label to a pull request, you opt in or out of system tests. Really, really simple, but it means we can have all of our tests available on all of our pull requests, and then we can choose when to run them. So rather than every test needing 27 hours of a million compute nodes on Google, which would cost quite a lot of money, you could opt in to decide, we'll do one a day, we'll do one a week, we'll do one if the code looks a bit dodgy. So you can kind of decide how much of a little testing to do. So by testing on the preview environment, it means you can go parallel and you get faster feedback. One of the worst things to do is do weekly tests. Like we've done 20 commits a day for seven days. Oh, something's broke. Oh, brilliant. So one of the 200 pull requests has broken something. Oh, this could take a while now. Whereas if you do it on every pull request, it's easy. It's like, oh, that one broke. We won't merge that one. So by testing before you merge, you keep the bad code out for merging. One of the more important things is it's not just how long does it take to fix a broken master. What's more important, when a category one issue comes in, oh my God, we are giving away credit card numbers on the internet because of some dodgy code. Let's get that fixed out now. We don't want to go, just a second, I've got some dodgy tests I just need to fix. I'm just going to fix these dodgy tests first. Just wait, 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 wait a second. The company is losing millions a second. And you're, oh, hang on a minute, we've just got a dodgy nerd, we'll, we'll be fine, just give us a couple of days, we'll be brilliant. You want to keep master clean, so that if anything serious happens, you can just go forwards with a fix really, really quickly, right? So please keep master clean. And the more you move to the pull request, the safer you can keep master. Yeah. Right, I'm so over time on this talk, but I'm just going to do one more quick demo. Um, and then, then we can have a beer, and then I'll do a much shorter talk after the beer, I promise. Um, <laughs> Particularly because I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about after this. Uh, thing. Uh, let me just show you. Uh, yeah, here we go. Let me see if this command works. Okay, let's pause. Oh, oh, it looks good. It looks good. Okay, so we've done one command to create a brand new project, and that one command then goes to the staging environment, and then one more command can put production, and then we can create a pull request, and it's just a normal pull request. There's no weird JX or anything, and then we get automated pipelines that do preview environments, which is all great stuff. And then from this point forward, it's just all Git, which is great. One of the next questions is, so then how do developers actually develop code before they do a git commit? So how do you develop this new WYSI microservice thing that's designed to run inside Kubernetes, inside the container in a cluster with yeah. Kubernetes service discovery and maybe one day service mesh magicness and all this kind of awesomeness. So in other words, how do you do pre-commit? How do you edit and run stuff before you're ready to go to production? Which is an interesting challenge and an interesting problem. Now, how many people have ever heard this before? It works on my laptop, right? This is, uh, I have heard this more times than I would, uh, it works on my laptop. I mean, it must be you, it's not me. It works on my laptop, it's your problem. Um, so if we're all developing containers now, and we're all using basically Linux and running things in a container on Linux and Kubernetes on your cloud provider's operating system, we should stop running things on a Windows laptop with a different JVM and a different version of Maven and a different version of Node and a different web browser and a different, because, not because it's not an interesting experiment, but we're basically <laughs> wasting our life testing on the wrong thing. You might go, oh yeah, it works great. Well, that's really useful, but that means nothing as to does it work in production, right? All we care about is does it work in production? That's all we should, we should worry about that first. Once it works in production, yeah, goof off if you've got like slack in your team, like crack on, but what we should focus on first is, does it work in production? So test in production first. So test everything in a container on Linux and Kubernetes. Do that first, don't do that last, do that first. 
Because the worst thing you can do is go, oh yeah, my code's not quite working, I'm just fixing this bug. It's some kind of thread scheduling networky thing that only exists on Windows, which we don't use in production. You're wasting your time, right? You're going slow. So the best thing to do is always run things in a production-like environment all the time, in a container, in Linux, in the same operating system, networking, DNS, persistent, file system, security, tokens, all the things, right? So here's how you do it. You type jmscrape dev pod, and what's a dev pod? So we have the containers inside Jenkins X for which version of Maven to use and which version of Gradle and which version of Helm and QCTL and Scaffold and all these different tools. So all the CI and CD pipelines are using these locked down versioned immutable images of software tools. What the dev pod is, is your own personal pod, pod just means a, a group of containers, it's your own personal developer workspace with all the same tools inside them. So the same version of Maven that we use for our CI CD, the same version of Node, the same version of Java, all the same environment variables that we use. So in other words, the environment is the same as production and you've got a terminal. So this terminal looks like it's on my Mac. This terminal is running in a container in Kubernetes with all the same software tools. So developers don't have to worry about my JVM is different on my Mac or my Windows box to the one that's in production and my Linux is different and my networking is different. And my I've got some weird Etsy hosts thing going on and whatever, it doesn't matter. This is running in the container in Kubernetes, right? So that's the first thing. So we've created a new container running in Kubernetes with our code inside. And then the other thing that's kind of cool is we get a web-based IDE. Now you can use a desktop IDE if you want. But if I click on this URL, this is a web-based IDE that's running in the dev pod as well. Let's see if it loads in time. Yay, it loaded, awesome. So this is the web-based IDE. Let me close some of these tabs down because I'm getting confused already. Uh, read out the old work tabs. I've honestly nearly finished this last demo and then we can have a beverage. Um, so this is a web-based IDE editing. In this case, I've got a Node.js application, right? Now I'm going to do one other little command. Um, where's my terminal? Let me move this around a bit so it's a bit easier. I'm going to type npm start because this is a Node application. So npm start. And then I'm going to open the port 8080 of this container. So this is, this is the Node app in my dev pod running, and I'm testing it for my browser. So I'm testing my app that's running in a container in Kubernetes, right? So this... This awesome application says hello nerdy from Jenkins X. And let me show you how kind of quick this is. So I'm going to type as quick as I possibly can. So I'm going to type awesome and then I'm going to hit reload. Boom. So in other words, I can develop and run code instantly running in a container in the same infrastructure, the same build tool, the same language, the same runtime, the same environment. I can test with a persistent volume. I can test with a service mesh. I can test with HTTP TLS encryption and t well, whatever, however your ingress works, however your service is going to work, are testing the same stuff as production, right? This is really important because what we're, most of us are doing is running random stuff on a laptop, which is nothing like production all the time. And we should all stop this, right? So the quick thing is use a dev pod. It lets you develop and test and iteratively try stuff in a container using the same stuff that CI and CD work. So if your stuff works in a dev pod, it's 99% likely it's going to work in exactly the same way inside your pull request and your preview and then staging and then production. Because what we all should be doing is developing software and getting it to production and using the same environment all the time. You should not develop on Windows and then just deploying production on Linux. That is insane, right? I've seen companies do that, by the way, which is insane. You want to be testing the same thing all the time because otherwise we're just wasting time by testing the wrong thing. So I totally overrun and I apologize. Um, so in summary, Jenkins X is awesome. You should definitely try it. Um, there's a couple of links at the end somewhere. Oh, yeah, there we go. So there's a website, please try it out. Uh, there's a community page. We all hang out on Slack. There's a Slack channel for the whole Kubernetes ecosystem where all the Kubernetes open source projects hang out, whether it's Kubernetes itself, whether it's Knative, whether it's uh, Jenkins X, whether it's Jenkins, whether it's Helm. There's a load of really good Slack channels. Jenkins X is obviously the best one, but there's other good ones. So pop along to Slack. We're there all the time. If you have any issues or questions about Jenkins X, well, please ask me tonight. I'm here all night, but uh, pop along anytime you like. Uh, we'll, we'll try and help you get going and get you going quickly. Um, and uh, yes, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I've got questions. I need to ask questions. Yeah. Just before beers.